Hi there. Welcome to Good Life Online Church. It's so good to have you join us from wherever you are. At the moment, we're doing the Good Life series. It's a six week program looking at the heart and mission of Good Life. So I really hope you enjoy what we have to share over this time. And I hope you feel equipped to live the good life that Jesus invites us into. Thanks, Jess, for that bio. Thanks for keeping it positive. All right. In preparation for today, I was, um, I was kind of reflecting on the first time I actually spoke here at Good Life. And if you don't remember, maybe you're here or not, but it was in our series called The Nine Beats. And it was my very first time up here. And, and obviously, I was very nervous. And then Mike gives me this topic, blessed are the persecuted. I was just like, what a stitch up. Is that even in the Bible? I don't know. I still don't know. And I was just like, thanks, Mike. That's awesome. I think he was just trying to look better. Like, he was nervous. He was new here as well. And he was just like, if I can just push Greg down, then I'll shine. Um, so I guess his strategies is, I don't judge him for that. I would have done the same. But you'd forgive me um, for being pretty nervous when he once again said, hey, Greg, we've got this new series and I've got a week just for you. And it's, it's a series I'm writing. And my heart stopped. And as it got closer, he was a little cagey on the details. And I was kept saying, like, what's happening, Mike? Which week is it? And he was just like, yeah, no, it's all good. And then quite recently, he told me, in this series uh, called The Good Life, you're going to be sharing the week on transformation. And again, I paused, and I was like, actually, hang on. I think that's good. That's actually a really great topic. And then I thought, look, if God can change my boss into a pretty good bloke, a reasonable human, then actually maybe I've got something good to share today. If he can be transformed, then maybe there's hope for all of us. <laughs> anyway, let's jump in. So our topic this week is transformation. And thanks to all those people who jumped into our life groups and are following along um, with the series. This week is a good one. So I want to start with a, a passage of scripture. It's from Colossians. Let's read it. It's going to be on the screen. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. And we'll jump a little bit further down the passage. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And I highlighted those words, everything. You see, I'm so glad that our God is maybe not like the culture we live in today. He's a God who's into restoration and transformation, not replacement, not upgrading, not like this throwaway culture. Our God is one who created and declared his creation good. We have this innate goodness and value. And now God, rather than start again, he seeks to make things right again. And this mission was announced through Jesus. And I want to follow up with another very well-known verse. John 3.16. Anyone went to Sunday school, you probably learn it, but I actually love verse 17 as well. And this is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and his only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and a lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help and to put the world right again. Can you see that word, that transformation, that restoration of the entire cosmos? This transformation begins with Jesus' resurrection and this inaugurated this new creation. We talked about that as we were studying Revelation. If you're interested, go back and I encourage you to listen to that. This resurrection of Jesus represents the dawn of God's kingdom breaking back into our present age and initiating this process of renewal that leads to the culmination, the restoration of all things. And that's what we got excited about as we're looking at Revelation. It's talking about when 
that restoration, that transformation is complete. N.T. Wright says it, this quote, he says, the message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that we're now invited to belong to it. We're invited to participate in it. Rich Philotus, though, puts a little bit of a um, pause on this. He says, deeply formed mission is first about who we are becoming before, we, before what we are doing. So yeah, for us to participate in this new creation, we actually need to be transformed. I think that's what Rich is getting to. We need to be changed first. And if you're following along in the study, I was a little bit surprised when I came across probably the first Bible verse that talks about transformation. And yeah, it's something you'll probably unpack if you're following this week, but I want to talk about it this morning. And it comes from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. And I was a little bit puzzled by this verse when I first read it. I'm obviously familiar with it before, but it kind of just stuck with me again. I was like, this doesn't sound like transformation to me. This sounds like upgrading. It sounds like, you know, buying a new iPhone, a new car. Not, not transformation. This sounds like replacement. Can anyone else re relate to that? It doesn't sound like the process the journey that I'm in, on in my life as I reflect about how I'm growing and changing it. It's been arduous, it's been hard. And just when I think I'm there and I think, no, I've, I've actually got this, then I go and do something or say something and I realise, oh gosh, I've got a long way still to go. I still need to be transformed. And I read this, this verse in Galatians. It says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. See, for me, that sounds more like transformation. It doesn't sound easy or fast. And look, self-professed, I'm a modern man, a father of two children, and truly em empathetic. And I was there in the room when my children were born, and I found it hard. It was a, a long, difficult journey for me. It was incredibly stressful. I actually had to leave for a little while just to recover and calm down. And towards the end, I vomited. And while I joke about this day, I actually think this metaphor fits perfectly. You see, on this day, yes, I became a father. Two, a cute little child, not so cute now, not so little now, still pooping, <laughs> bundle of joy named Hendrix. But you see, I was now a father, but I didn't feel like a father. I wasn't manly and tough. Can I have the next slide? I was quite a contrast to who I thought I should be, who I wanted to be. I was terrified. I didn't have a beard, I didn't have an axe. <laughs> I wasn't patient, I wasn't nurturing, I wasn't wise. Mostly I was just burying my selfishness, just trying to survive and keep up with my beautiful wife. You see, I'd, I'd begun the journey of living into my new identity. I was a father, but I wasn't there yet. I was now tr on that journey, on that path. And I wish I was there. I look back and wish I'd been better. And still I'm not there yet. Just ask Hendrix or don't, please. <laughs> I'm still on that journey. But I am a father. Similarly, I think that's what that verse in Corinthians is talking about. It speaks to the spiritual transformation that occurs when a person becomes a follower of Jesus. The transformation is in our identity first. This is instant. It's about us stepping into and acknowledging we are part of God's new creation. We're stepping into this story of reconciliation of all things, of the world. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and transform our lives. However, within that, I'm, it's still me. It's still us. And this, pro, this process of personal transformation, which, in grow, uh, which involves growing and maturing, 
and changing my character to align with this identity, it takes time. While my identity as a new creation in Christ happens in that instant, and God can do miracles, I don't discredit that, and people experience breakthroughs in different areas, but generally, this process of aligning our thoughts, our attitudes, and our behaviours with our new identity in Christ is an ongoing and lifelong process, a journey. Now, in Romans, it tells us where this begins. Where does this transformation start? It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We must renew our mind first. And this is that first step and that deliberate effort. Rich Philotus, again, he's awesome in this space of transformation and spiritual practice. He says, limited reflection usually leads to dangerous reaction. And I can really relate to that. And I think that's why, if we're going to be transformed, spiritual practices are so important. And here's some of them here. There's lots, and the list goes on. These deliberate practices to renew ourselves. But that's actually not what I want to focus on this morning. It's something you'll be encouraged to do and think about and discuss, and these are all fantastic things. And something um, in, the, in this week's discussion to explore with your groups and challenge to explore something new. But I feel there's an, uh, something more important here. And it gets to what Jess was sharing this morning about our intention. And what Mike, a word that stood out for me from his message last week was our posture. By posture, how do we position ourselves within our spiritual practices? Or even more broadly, how are we positioning ourselves all the time as we interact with, with the world and other people. And made me think about this story that Jesus told, the parable of the sower. It's in Matthew 13. I'm going to read it to you. It says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil where underlying rock, with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. So those, many of us would be familiar with this parable would know that Jesus then goes on to explain the true meaning here behind this parable. All Jesus' stories had that deeper meaning, that heavenly invitation in them. And I admit that once, when I first, as a younger person, heard this story, I actually thought this was purely just that salvation encounter with God. It was this one-off decision where the soil fell, where the seed fell on our hearts. But more recently, as I look at this verse, I think it's a constant positioning of ourselves. How's our heart? How's our intention in our spiritual practices when we come to church, when we worship, when we go out into the world to interact and, and share God's love with other, others? How are we positioning ourselves? What's my heart like? Because I think God is a generous God who speaks to us all the time in many and mysterious ways, like Jess had acknowledged. This is largely a mystery. And that's why we gather here, because we're searching through the mystery, clinging on to the things that we know for sure, but we're journeying together. And I think this story is a reminder that our posture should be like that fertile soil at all times. It should be open, taking time to listen, seeking to understand and accept. It's, it's a call to persevere, to stay faithful and endure through desert seasons or tough seasons of life. It's faithful, it's committed to pursuing godliness and it's undistracted by society, which is, has a totally different focus, which is measured by busyness and outward appearance and wealth. Now, I was brushing my teeth earlier this week and contemplating my message for today, and I actually truly believe I had one of those Holy Spirit moments. And this verse came to my heart. It's one of my favourites, but it was just like 
so left of field. It just wasn't on my mind. And then these two clear pictures came to me and I thought, it's really filled me with confidence and joy as I prepared today. And you'll be very familiar with it. It's a well-known one. It says, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And it wasn't until this week that that last part of the verse really resonated, resonated with me, to walk with God. You see, one of my favourite things to do as a family um, is to walk the Noosa National Park. I, know about, I hope everyone here has experienced that. It's just stunning. And on this walk, there's times where our family's silent. We're just walking. We're just taking in the beautiful scene, scenery and we're reflecting. There are times where we pause and we share the view And we share our thoughts, we share our different um, perspectives on other walkers and their outfits. Um, We talk about the week that's been, and we talk about the week that's coming ahead. We journey together, we walk together. Often not speaking, but aware. And if someone's weary, we pause or we slow down. Or if we're feeling good, we pick up the pace and we keep going. And I actually love the idea of this applied, that metaphor, that picture applied to walking with God. It's about sharing the journey. I think sometimes it's seeking that direct connection, and that's where the spiritual practices are super important and super powerful. Learn, um, leaning in at times of struggle, when we're weary, we pause together with God. Or other moments, just expressing gratitude, taking in the view, sharing appreciation. And I think if we want to be transformed, we must walk this journey of life with God consistently. It's intentional. It's directional. It's targeted towards a goal. It's a slow process. Walking is slow, sometimes painfully slow with children. And can be very challenging. It can be tiring. The other thing that stood out here was how we walk. Our attitude on this journey, walking humbly. I'm currently working um, at a school on the coast as a school counsellor. And in this role, I um, seek to help students navigate some of the tricky challenges they face in their lives. And I was reflecting on two students I'd helped just this week gone. The first one burst into my office, desperate to talk to me. And just straight away was like, I am very emotionally intelligent. My teacher was the one acting childishly. And this went on for quite a while. And another made a long list of ways she could, this student could really talk. A long list of ways she had been wronged and mistreated by others. And it went on. It was exhausting. But actually, neither of them were interested in looking at themselves or their own parts in this story. And despite my best efforts to encourage this self-reflection, I felt like I was of absolutely no help to them. You see, without humility, there can't be, there can't be any true self-reflection. Conviction, change and growth. There can be no transformation. If we want to be transformed, we must be humble. And I think this idea of um, humility and self-reflection is, is super important as we journey life and spirituality in a community, a church. And Mike touched on this also last week, the idea of giving and receiving grace. Humility has the power to bring unity amongst diversity. It extends grace to others at different places on the journey. It acknowledges that we're at different places on the journey. Because it actually accepts that we're on the journey. We're not there yet. And it accepts that just like I need, I extend grace to others, I actually need to receive and be extended grace at different times. I think humility drives transformation because it really, it accepts that we haven't arrived and we never will. So what does a transformed life look like and why is this so important? The verse in Galatians stood out to me. 
But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the image of a transformed life. And when we live transformed lives and our lives overflow with these fruits, we align with Christ and his mission to put the world right. We become part of the restoration and the transformation of the world. Just like where we started, God's mission in the beginning was to renew the whole cosmos. And our role is to pay our part in that. We bring God's kingdom. We transform the lives of people around us, bringing healing, hope, restoration, bringing things back to the way they were always meant to be. And I think this is not an invitation to an easy life. It's not an invitation to a comfortable life. In fact, Jesus never promised that. He promised the opposite. He said, in this life you will have trouble and hardship, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And that's why we've labelled this the good life, not either of those other things. It is the good life. It's the good invitation that God gives to all of us. It brings hope to this world. And I guess that's our invitation this morning, is to participate in that. To be transformed before we take part and we transform the world around us. And I hope something this morning resonated with you. For me, this week in particular, it's been that idea of walking with God, that constant awareness of God in my life and in the lives of all around me and his mission to renew this world. And it's that reminder to be humble. So easy to think you've got something down pat or you have the right theology or the right way of looking at things, but God invites us to stay humble, to love and accept others, to give and receive grace. It's the best way to live. Will you stand with me? Thanks for joining us for Online Church today. Please don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, like the video and follow us on social media. It really does mean a lot. Otherwise, we'll see you next week.